Listen, in case you deviate again, in case you get off the road again and miss the mark again, you need the mirror there to show you you're off the track, don't you? You can never dispense with God's great law, my friends. You will always need it there to show you when you're missing the mark and when you're sinning. And then it'll all Many Christians believe that obedience is legalism. Today, Joe Cruz, Amazing Facts Crusade speaker, concludes his message on the relationship of works and faith. His subject, Does God's Grace Blot Out His Law? Now let's read this verse. Uh, in Romans 6 and verse 14, once again, very, very clearly. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Now let me give you a little illustration here to prove without any question that you cannot keep on sinning and remain under grace. That's the big point I want to make right here. What does it mean to be under the law? What does it mean to be under grace? To be under the law means to be under the guilt of it, under the condemnation of it, be walking contrary to it. To be under grace means that you've accepted the salvation from breaking the law, from your sins, and from your violation of that law, and now you're walking in obedience to Him. Let's suppose here for just a moment that somebody has been found guilty of a terrible crime. Let's say murder, the very worst kind of wicked, violent murder, and this person has been brought in and tried by jur jury, found guilty, and sentenced to death. So here's that person now waiting for the execution date to come around. This man is really under the law, isn't he? He's under the guilt, under the penalty, under the condemnation, and there he is now waiting for the death sentence to be executed upon him. While he's waiting for that sentence to be executed, the governor reviews the man's case. He finds some extenuating circumstances and decides that he'll pardon this man because there's some question about his guilt. So the governor sits down and writes out a full pardon, which is grace, isn't it? Now the man's guilty, the man's under the law, and he's uh, waiting to die. The governor decides to pardon him. He writes out a pardon. This is grace. The pardon arrives in the prison. The man gets his hands on it, and he's a free man. He's no longer under the law. He can walk out of that prison, go down the street. Not a policeman can lay hands on him. Why? Because he's under grace now. He's been forgiven. He's been pardoned. And he walks down the street. Now tell me, friends, because this man is no longer under the law but under grace, is he free to go down the street and break the law now? Can he go steal again now that he's under grace and no longer under the law? Of course not. In fact, wouldn't you say that he's doubly obligated to keep the law now because he has been pardoned and because he's been forgiven? Surely he is. Have you ever heard a siren behind you as you were speeding along on the way to keep an appointment? You look back and here came the police car and pulled you over to the side. The policeman comes walking up there to the window, you know, with his little pad in hand, and he begins to write, writing out a ticket because he caught you on his radar. And you were speeding, no doubt about it. You knew you were. You were in a hurry. You had to get down there for some very great emergency. And so you start telling the policeman about it. You explain to him that you had to be there, that it was a very urgent matter and emergency, in fact, and so you were going a little over the speed limit, but you're begging him for mercy. And right in the middle of his writing, the policeman stops. And he slowly tears the ticket out and tears it up and drops it on the ground. He says, all right, I will let you go this time, but, <laughs> but what? What do you think he means by that? <laughs> but what? Now he's giving you grace, isn't he? You were caught. You were guilty. You were under the law but he's going to forgive you. He's going to pardon you. He's going to give you grace. But, but what? My friends, when you come into grace, does that mean now you're free to go break the law again? 
Absolutely not. When you're saved by grace through Christ, are you free to go back now and disobey His commandments? Of course not. In fact, you will be so very careful never to break that law again, if possible, in appreciation for what was done for you. You love that man because he tore up that ticket. You love the Lord because he pardoned you your sins. Turn with me to Romans 3.31. Now, you want to see a very dramatic biblical statement on what I've just said. Here it is. Romans 3.31. Paul says, do we then make void the law through faith? Now, what is the question he's asking? Do we nullify the Ten Commandments because we've been saved by grace through faith? That's the question he's asking. Is God's law set aside? Is it canceled out because I've been saved by grace? And what is the answer? God forbid, he says. Yea, we establish the law. Why, he says, when you are saved by grace through faith, the law becomes stronger for you. It becomes more important for you to keep the law. Forbid, he said, God forbid that you should go out there and think you can now break it just because you have become a Christian. Now somebody uh, might say, well, uh, Brother Joe, uh, after we come to Christ, after the law points out our sins and brings us to the foot of the cross where we get cleansing and pardon, we don't need it anymore. It has fulfilled its function now. And we can go down the road without the law. We don't need it anymore. Oh, no, friends. Listen, in case you deviate again, in case you get off the road again and miss the mark again, you need the mirror there to show you you're off the track, don't you? You can never dispense with God's great law, my friends. You will always need it there to show you when you're missing the mark and when you're sinning. And then it'll always point you back to the place where you can get pardon and cleansing for your sin. Listen, you don't keep the law in order to be saved. You keep it because you are saved. You see, the law points out sin. Grace saves you from sin. The law is the will of God. Grace is the power to do the will of God. Now, did you follow that? Let me read you the text that actually has both law and grace and the very same verse. It's found in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 and verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Now, he's pointing out God's people. He's pointing out those who were saved. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. There's the law, isn't it? And the faith of Jesus. There you have faith. There you've got grace. Those who are saved, my friends, and are going to meet the approval of God, keep His law, and they also have faith in Jesus, they're saved by grace. Law and grace in the same text. Somebody may say, well, I thought you said, though, that you're not saved by works, and, and you, the law isn't going to justify us. Then why do we have to worry about it? Why do we have to keep it if it's not going to save us, if it doesn't have anything to do with our redemption? Well, now, friends, I told you that we're not, we're not uh, uh, saved by works. Of course not. But are we saved without works? No, no. The Bible said that we're saved for good works. You keep it because you're saved. That's the way you show your love. Don't you think you'll love the one who saves you and forgives you and cleanses you and justifies you? Of course. Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Well, don't you think we should love him who came and lived and died for us? That's the only way, friends, that we really can show our love for one another. You mothers uh, that have little girls, if you tell your little girl day by day, look, honey, I want you to dry the dishes for me today, and every time you told her that, she would run out the door and say, no, I'm not going to do it, I'm going out to play. You know, after a while, you would begin to wonder if that little girl really loved you, wouldn't you? And you men who are sitting out there tonight with your wives by your side, I'll tell you something, you just didn't talk to that little lady when you were courting her and trying to get her hand in marriage. You didn't just talk. You did something. You took her out to eat. You brought her flowers and candy and other things. And if you hadn't done that, you probably wouldn't have her here tonight by your side because faith without works is dead. And I'll tell you something else. Love without works is dead too. Nobody's going to believe you if you don't do something to show your love. 
Now let's turn to 1 John 2, 4 and read that very thing in the Bible. 1 John 2, 4. This is a text I don't even like to, uh, uh, to quote because uh, it sounds bad if I try to quote it. I like to read it exactly like it is in the Scriptures. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Isn't that something, friends? That's strong. The Bible says if you claim to be a Christian and you don't keep his commandments, you're lying. You don't really love him. Well, isn't that what Jesus said? If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Of course. And uh, if we really love him, that's what we'll do. And if you find a person who claims to be a Christian and he's walking in disobedience and violation of God's law, I'll tell you one thing. That man doesn't have a saving relationship at all with Christ. If he is willfully and knowingly walking in disobedience, he is not saved at all. The Bible says so. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he that, what? That doeth. He that doeth. Is doing important, friends? Of course it's important. For the right motive. Don't be doing it in order to win your salvation. You can't earn your salvation. Do it because you love him, because he saved you, and now you want to show your gratitude and your love for him because he has saved you. Do you know what real love is, friends? Do you know what real love is? The world today has such a shallow conception of love. You see all of these bumper stickers going along the road. Have you noticed that? Smile if you love Jesus. Wave if you love Jesus. Honk if you love Jesus. Have you seen any of those things on the highways? You know, that's a cheap idea about love, isn't it? Our Lord didn't say smile if you love me or honk if you love me or wave if you love me. He said if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. That's real, isn't it? That's real. That's a way to show it. Nothing else will do it. Nothing else will do it. In fact, you know what the Bible definition of love is? Now, let's come right down to the brass tacks tonight. What is love? What is love? Is it just a beautiful, aesthetic definition? Oh, no. Look at 1 John 5 now. 1 John 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God. Now, he's going to tell us what it is. He's going to define it for us. And this is the disciple of love. John, the beloved, the one who leaned on the bosom of Jesus, the one who's the warmest, the most tender-hearted of the disciples, is going to define love for us. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. <laughs> there it is. And my friends, if you find somebody that claims to be a Christian, that claims to be saved by grace, and they are willfully walking in disobedience to God's law, I'm telling you they're not under grace at all, they're under disgrace. And that's one of the worst disgraces I can think of. Somebody claiming that they're living under the new covenant and that they don't have to obey the law of God. Listen, the new covenant is the writing of God's law in the heart, isn't it? We're going to be talking about this on one of the programs soon. Of course it is. It's the writing of God's law in the heart. And anybody that claims they don't have to keep that law and believes that they're still under grace and under the new covenant, they don't understand what it's all about. They really don't. Now let's go to a text in Romans again. Romans <clears throat> uh, chapter, chapter 7 of Romans. We're going to read verse 3 and then verse 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Now let's pause here a moment and ask a question. What was it the law could not do for us because we were too weak in the flesh to keep it? What was it the law could not do? It couldn't save us, could it? It could not justify us because we were too weak anyway in the unconverted state to obey it. So let's read on. What the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh? God, sending His own Son in the likeness of sin, and for sin, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. In other words, now Christ came and lived in the flesh. Just like you and I are here living in this world, my friends, Christ came and became one of us. And he lived here a life of total obedience to his Father in the same nature that you and I have. He became one of us and obeyed perfectly and condemned sin in the flesh. 
Why did he do it? Look at the next verse. In order that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And that word righteousness is the Greek word dikaioma, which means literally the just requirement of the law. In other words, my friends, the only way that you and I can fulfill the requirements of the law is to do it through Christ who came and lived here and perfectly obeyed that law and the power and strength of His heavenly Father. And he promises now to move into your life and mine and give us the power to also obey that same law. That's the way we can do it, friends, the only way we can do it. You know, I was invited to lecture in a seminary in this country, one of the most popular and well-known. In fact, if I mentioned it, you would know exactly what seminary it was and where it was located. But I was invited to speak to the senior theological students of that seminary on this very subject of law and grace. I'll never forget it. I found out first before I went there what they believed and what they taught on that subject. And uh, when I uh, got up to speak, I said, Now I understand that you believe. And I read this verse, by the way, in, in Romans 7, verse 3. Uh, uh, Romans 7, uh, verse, uh, Romans 8, pardon me, 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. I read that text. And, and I said, Now uh, I understand that you believe that the law is holy and we are carnal, sold under sin. And therefore, it's impossible for us to ever keep the law. No matter how good we become, no matter how good a Christian we are, that we can't do it because the law is holy and we're fleshly, and therefore we cannot keep it. And so you believe we ought to do our best and come as far as we can in doing it, obtain as much of the obedience as we possibly can, and, and if we come up there to keeping uh, uh, seven or eight or nine of them, you believe that the Lord will make up the difference with His own righteousness and save us anyway. Is that what you believe? They said, yes, that's what we believe. The professor there said, yes, that's what we believe in this seminary. Well, now I said, I don't believe that way at all. And I filled up a glass on the blackboard. And I said, now let's let this glass represent the law. And we're going to fill up this law with obedience. And, and I filled it up there about nine-tenths of the way. And, and I said, now you believe if I can keep it that much of it, that I don't have to keep the rest of it. God will make up the difference and save me even in my disobedience. They said, yes, that's right. You do your best and God will save you. I said, well, now, friends, I don't believe that. I believe that your best would not even produce obedience to one. It's true, the law of spiritual. We're carnal, sold under sin. And in ourselves, in our own strength and by our own efforts, we can't even keep one of them. So forget about coming up to seven or eight or nine of them. You can't even begin to keep the first one without Christ. But with Christ living in your heart, you can keep ten of them as well as you can keep one of them. And that's what God expects of us. He doesn't give us a 10% discount on the Ten Commandments, friends. God doesn't say, if you'll just try your best and come up to five or six of them, I'll save you anyway and make up the rest myself. No, no, God says, look, you can't do anything by yourself. Without me, you can do nothing. But with me, you can do all things, and you can obey all of them if you'll let me come into your life and live out my life there in your life. And my friends, I believe that. I really believe that. And these people that try to make excuses for sin, I don't agree with it. I've had people say, well, Brother Joe, you know, I don't need the law. I don't need the Ten Commandments. You see, uh, uh, I've got a conscience, and my conscience tells me what's right. And the Holy Spirit lives in me, and the Holy Spirit is, is telling me what to do and, and how to live. I don't need the Ten Commandments to tell me what's right and wrong and how to live in this life. And those people who say that walk along there flagrantly violating one of the commandments of God. I'll tell you something, my friends. If you have any question about whether you're doing something right or wrong, you better not trust your feeling to tell you whether it's right or wrong. You come to the book of God and find out what His law says. You find out what the Word of God teaches as to what's right and wrong. And uh, put those impulses and those feelings aside. You think it's the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you something. The Holy Spirit is not going to speak contrary to the Word, is it? In fact, the Bible says that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. That means it's a cutting edge of the, of the Holy Spirit, friends. The Bible, that's the way the Holy Spirit operates. In fact, the very first work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. That's what the Bible says. He will convince you or convict you, uh, the world, of sin. And what is sin? 
transgression of the law. Which law? The Ten Commandments. So if a person is walking along there breaking any of the Ten Commandments willfully and says that he's filled with the Spirit and being guided by the Spirit, he is wrong. He's mistaken but the, because the Holy Spirit doesn't abide in the life of a person who is willfully transgressing the law of God. In fact, let's go to Acts 5, 32 and read a text that specifically tells us that. In Acts 5 and verse 32, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Whom God hath given to whom? To them that obey him. My friends, the Holy Spirit only lives and abides in the life of those who are obedient. And when we turn away from keeping his law, the Holy Spirit cannot live there, cannot abide there. In fact, there's a text of the Bible in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, that says that a man, well, let's go read it. What is it? Proverbs 28. Let's find it. I believe it's 28 and verse 9. Here's another one that I don't like to try to quote because it's such a solemn, serious text. Proverbs 28 and verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Isn't that terrible? If a man refuses to walk in the light of God's revealed will in his holy law, the Bible says that his very prayer becomes an abomination before God. Now, here's my next question. How many of the Ten Commandments do we have to break in order to be guilty of sin? How many of them? Why, of course, it's like a chain, isn't it? And uh, with ten links. And uh, D.L. Moody used to say, if you break one of the links, you've broken the chain. If you break one of the Ten Commandments, you've broken the law of God. Come with me to James now, chapter <clears throat> chapter uh, 2, and let's read verses 10 to 12. James 2 and verses 10 to 12. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Why, this quote's right out of the Ten Commandments. And it says, if you break one of them, you become guilty, you become a transgressor, you become a sinner. If you keep nine of them and just disobey one of them deliberately and willfully, my friends, you can't be saved because it shows that you don't love the Lord enough. You're not going to be saved or lost just because of works that you've done. You'll be saved or lost, my friend, because you don't love Jesus enough. He said, if you love me, you'll keep those commandments. You know, this is the reason Paul says there'll be no liars in heaven. Why? Because one of the Ten Commandments says, notice it says we'll be judged here by the law, doesn't it? So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law. If you came right up to the gates of heaven, my friends, there would be God's law. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery. And Paul says that no liars will be there, no adulterers will be there, no idolaters will be there, no covetous man will be there, no thieves will be there. Go right down the list. The Bible says none of those people will be there. Why? Because they're being judged by the law. And the law will be there to test your love. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do it. Oh, friends, don't you love him tonight? Don't you love him for what he did for you? Aren't you willing to follow him not to earn your salvation? You can't be saved by your works, but you won't be saved without them either because Jesus said, it's your works that prove to, to me that you love me. And if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I was down in New Orleans having a crusade. And by the way, that's one of the most wicked cities I think I've ever been in to hold a crusade. And while I was there, I learned about an old slave market that that used to exist there. In fact, they still sort of preserved it, and they used to auction human beings on that, uh, on, in that market. And I heard the story of how they were selling this old Negro slave, and he was very rebellious, saying, I won't work, I won't work. But two planters were bidding for him, and the price kept going higher and higher, and finally one of them won the bid. And then he took the old slave into the wagon, and they started back to the plantation. But all the way out there, he said, I won't work, I won't work. But when they arrived and got down from the wagon, the planter said, now listen, I have bought you to make you free, to turn you loose. You can go now. You're no longer a slave. And according to the story that I heard, the old man fell down at the feet of the planter and he said, Master, I'll serve you forever. 
And isn't that what Jesus did for us, friends? We were in bondage. We were lost. And Jesus set us free. He paid the price. He gave the redemption for us. And what do you think we ought to do? We ought to fall down at His feet and say, Master, I love you for what you did. I'll serve you forever. That's why you and I, my friends, should keep God's law right now. May God give us that love for Him that will gladly do it. How many of you tonight would say, Brother Joe, that's exactly the way I feel, and that's what I want to do. Show my love for Him by my obedience and by keeping His law. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye To Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie I'm bound for the promised land, I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me, I'm bound for the promised land. For all those boys extended plain shine.